All right. So I think that chapter 5 of Mark should be viewed in response to the disciples' question at the end of chapter 4. At the end of chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples are at sea, and there's a storm, and Jesus is sleeping through the storm. And the disciples, they wake Jesus, and they ask him the question, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus answers them. He says, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Jesus' disciples have seen both his power and his care demonstrated for them countless times. But their faith, it just doesn't reflect it. And so in Mark chapter 5, we see just how powerful and caring Jesus truly is. Jesus conquers our demons, he conquers our sin, and the curse of our sin, which is death. And all of these are our enemy, and they try to prevent us from experiencing life. Jesus conquers all of them in order to give us life. So let's look at one of our enemies' sin and see how our caring king conquers our sin to give us life. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the blood, the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion, weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talita kumi which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The woman Jesus heals has a disease that is related to her menstrual cycle. Uh, there were certain religious laws called cer ceremonial laws during this time that made people ceremonially unclean. A woman was considered ceremonially unclean during her menstrual cycle. And this woman had a blood flow that, accord, that occurred more than just once a month. Because she had a constant blood flow, she was considered constantly ceremonially unclean all the time. Whoever or whatever touched this woman would be considered ceremonially unclean also. And what did she do? She snuck up behind Jesus and touched his garment, and she was immediately healed. This woman had spent all the money that she had on 
physicians who couldn't heal her. She had been to the, the medical experts of her day who had no power over her disease. And what is Mark showing us about Jesus here? He's showing us that Jesus has extraordinary power to heal his people of disease. What does Jesus say to this woman after she has been healed? He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. According to the ceremonial law, this woman was supposed to wait seven days before she was considered ceremonially clean. And on the eighth day, she was to take an offering to the priest for him to make an atonement for her before the Lord. And the offering of atonement was given in order for there to be peace between those who were ceremonially unclean and the Lord. And so in this instance, the person that is ceremonially clean, unclean is this woman. And it was given to restore the relationship between the offended and God. One of the benedictions that you have probably heard several times comes from uh, Numbers 6, 24 through 27. And it's a, a priestly blessing that priests were to say over the people and to declare to them the Lord's promise of favor and blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. And what does it mean for the Lord to make his face to shine upon you and for him to lift off his countenance upon you? It means that, you, that he looks upon you in good favor and he blesses you. And the opposite of these is, is true for the Lord to, to turn his face from you and for him not to lift up his countenance upon you, which means that you have offended him and you don't receive favor from him. We also learn from this passage that the Lord is the one who gives his people peace. Peace here is referring to shalom, which means not only peace with God, but peace in every area of life. And so when Jesus tells this woman she will... She is well, and for her to go in peace, he is acting like a priest to her. He is declaring that she is clean and that he has done everything needed for things to be right between her and God. He is the Lord who looks upon her with pleasure and favor, so she may now go in peace knowing this. What is Mark showing us about Jesus? He is showing us that Jesus has extraordinary priestly power to make and declare his people clean. God gave the, the ceremonial law to Israel to be in an external way of showing them that they had an internal problem going on in their heart. These uh, laws were designed to be like a, a red dash light that comes on your dash to get your attention that something is wrong with your motorbike or car that needs to be fixed. All of the many diseases like this woman's disease and leprosy they could make you be considered ceremonially unclean and were designed to show the people of God that they had an internal disease of the heart, sin, which made them unclean before the Lord. And so the whole ceremonial system was given by God to show Israel their sin and point them to Jesus, who is our great and powerful priest who takes care of our sin for us. When Jesus heals this woman of her disease, he is showing us that he has the ability to conquer our disease, which is sin, and to declare us clean. The power of any disease is its ability to do harm to the host. A skin tag is a growth on the skin that's usually small, and it just hangs from the skin. And physicians, they wouldn't consider a skin tag a disease because it's just a nuisance, and it might look funny. And so people sometimes will have these removed, but they do no harm to the person. They're not a disease. But physicians do consider stage 4 melanoma to be a disease. It's a skin disease that has penetrated through all the layers of the skin, and it has made its way to other parts of the body, like the brain and the lungs and the liver or the stomach. So it not only causes dysfunction in the skin, it causes dysfunction in other parts of the body as it has spread to it. The power of stage 4 melanoma is its ability to quickly do great damage to a person who has it. What is the power of our disease, sin? The power of sin is its ability to do us harm by making us guilty before the Lord. 
God is perfect and requires perfect obedience from those he shows favor to. Being guilty of committing just one sin is extremely offensive to a perfect God. I sin multiple times every day, so when you add all of those sins up, I'm extremely offensive to a perfect God. And because I'm guilty of sin, the Lord no longer can look upon me and shine his face upon me. He cannot lift up his countenance upon me and give me peace. Therefore, my sin has caused me to have a guilty status before the Lord, and I can no longer have peace with him. How does Jesus heal us of our disease of sin? It is by what he does for us at the cross. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 tells us, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And so it is at the cross where we see our king's care for us so brightly demonstrated. At the cross, Jesus takes our guilty status upon himself and God looks on Christ as having committed all of our sins. The Father looks upon Jesus with displeasure, and in a sense, he turns his face away from his Son. Because of this displeasure, he pours his righteous wrath out upon Jesus for all of our sin. And when God is finished with Christ at the cross, God no longer gives a guilty verdict because Christ has done everything needed to take away that guilty status that we have before the Lord. As we see in Colossians, Jesus meets all of the legal demands that God as our judge is, satis is looking at. He looks at the requirements of, of the penalty for breaking the law, and he says, I am satisfied with these legal requirements that Jesus has met for you. And so Jesus renders sin powerless because without its ability to make us guilty before the Lord without its ability to give us a guilty status before the Lord, it can no longer do us harm. It no longer has the ability to make us guilty. Jesus heals us from our disease of sin and now can declare us well, which means we are clean before the Lord. It is because of Jesus' work at the cross that God can turn his face towards us and lift up his countenance upon us. And from the moment that we place our faith in Christ, we immediately receive the work Christ has done for us at the cross. And in the eyes of God, he no longer sees us as having sin. Because of what Christ has done at the cross in conquering our enemy of sin, God is able to give us a new life in Christ in which he favors us. He turns his face towards us and looks upon us with pleasure. When a person comes to faith in Christ, it's like a patient who had stage four melanoma that had spread to every part of the body. When the doctor went back to check, he didn't find anything, not even a skin tag, only perfectly smooth skin. And when you combine what we have seen here of Jesus conquering our sin with the other two stories in Mark 5 that shows he conquers evil forces uh, through healing, uh, exercising the demons and the demoniac, and also conquering the curse of our sin, which is death, we see that there is nothing that our king cannot or will not conquer to bring us life. He has overcome all of our enemies and thus removed all of the obstacles so that we can now have life in him. When I was 16 years old, I went to go get my driver's license. I came to the, the last part of the test, which is the parallel parking. And if you've ever parallel parked, you, you know how difficult that can be. Uh, whenever I was uh, taking that test, um, my driver instructor, she put out, or there were two cones set out. And so I had to get my car perfectly in line within these two cones. And if you hit a cone once, it disqualified you. And I was driving my mother's big clunky van at the time and I attempted to parallel park about seven times. And I looked at my driver test instructor and I said, I can't do this. Um, she was maybe one of the most patient women uh, 
that I've ever met in my life. I said, I can't do this. And so she gets out of the passenger seat. She went and she picked up the cone that was behind my mom's van and she moved it back. And she said, sometimes, uh, she said the testing center is next to a prison and sometimes prisoners come out and they move these cones. And she said, I'm sure that's what happened this morning. And I said, I'm sure that's what happened too. <laughs> And this is what Jesus has done for us in conquering our enemies like sin. He has removed the obstacles that would prevent us from life with him. There is no evil, there is no sin, there, not even physical death that can keep us from the life we now have in Christ because Christ has defeated all of our enemies. He has removed all of our obstacles. So instead of being in fear like the disciples were in fear in the boat that day with Jesus, let us rest assured that our king has conquered our sin and all the rest of our enemies. We can rest assured that there is nothing that can keep us from the new life he has given in us. Romans 8, 34 through 39 is a reminder of this. It says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is saying here that God has turned his face towards us and looks on us in favor and in love. And there is nothing that can take that away. There is nothing that can cause God to turn his face away from us. There is no evil power that can stop this because Christ has conquered them all. And to this, let us say amen. We have looked at how our king has conquered our sin and the rest of our enemies in order to give us life. Now I want to take a few minutes to look more at the compassion and care of our king um, and how he cares for us that we see displayed in how he cares for this woman he has healed. Mark sandwiches or stitches these two stories together, the woman with a, a disease and the dead little girl. And I think the reason he does this is because he wants to, us to see them in parallel, and he wants us to see the, the similarities between the, the two stories and the characters in the story, specifically Jesus and Jairus. He does this so that we will associate the emotions that we have with Jairus with Jesus. When Jairus is at Jesus' feet, begging him to come and to heal his daughter, what does he call her? He says, my little girl. This girl is 12 years old. She is no longer a little girl, but he calls her my little girl. Whenever I was a teenager, my mother would tell me that parents never stop seeing their children as children. They never stop caring for them or having that same compassion they did for, for them whenever they were little as the, whenever they get old. And so as children get older, their parents never stop loving them. For fathers, that little girl that you held as a newborn, she will always be your princess, even when she is married and 40 years old. Jairus has told Jesus that his daughter as the, is at the point of death, which means that she is about to die. There is no time to waste. They must hurry if Jesus is to make it to her bedside before she dies. And on their way, someone touches Jesus, and he senses power has gone out from him to heal. Why does Jesus take so much time to find a woman in a crowd of people when he knows Jairus' daughter is dying? The problem has been fixed. He has healed this woman's body of disease. Why doesn't he just move on? It is because he is looking for his child whose heart needs to be healed and touched by him just as much as her body did. His compassion for her will not let him move on until he cares for her heart first. She is like a, a child who has fallen and scraped her knee that must have her boo-boo kissed by her father. Bart wants us to see that Jesus has 
just as much compassion and care for his daughter as Jairus does for his. Because this woman has a constant flow of blood, she is constantly considered ceremonially unclean. Whoever or whatever touches her becomes ceremonially unclean also. This woman and whoever knew this woman and knew her disease would have treated her and viewed her as continuously unclean all the time. In modern times, it would be like this woman had an active case of COVID in 2021 that never went away. One day in 2021, during one of the major COVID lockdowns, Macy and I hopped into a taxi and headed to the grocery store. And whenever we got into the taxi, it was about, from our place to the grocery store, it was about 10 minutes. Whenever I hopped into the taxi, I could smell that the taxi driver had sprayed some type of anti-disinfectant into the car. And about two minutes after uh, of being into the ride, uh, my throat started closing up and I got that uncontrollable tickle in your throat whenever you are allergic to something. Uh, My eyes began to weep uncontrollably and I stopped talking to Macy because I knew if I kept talking to her, it would just make things worse. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm about to have this uncontrollable coughing spell and this taxi driver is going to think that I have COVID. I had an overwhelming fear of shame, of shame, um, and I thought, what will I do if this man thinks this of me? And so thankfully, we made it to the grocery store. Uh, I handed the taxi driver the money. I never spoke to him. I never said a word. And so I just went behind the grocery store, and I just had this coughing spell. This woman, she had had this disease for 12 years, and she would have been thought of by everyone around her and herself as unlovable and filthy. How does Jesus care for this woman who would have experienced so much social rejection and shame for so long? He cares for her by pressing the realities of what he has done for her and the new life he has given to her, to her heart. In healing her, he has given her a a new family and a new identity. This woman's body, it was healed But the place in her heart that God created us to be accepted and wanted and feel like we belong to others and him, it still needed healing. He needed to kiss the outside of her boo-boo so that he could heal the inside of her heart. Jesus shows us that he cares about our life and he came to give us peace. And the peace that Jesus is referring to is the same peace that we looked at in number six. It is shalom, or peace in a holistic sense, meaning peace in every area of life. Our king knows his children, and he searches the depths of our hearts. He knows what we need and when we need it the most. He cares about those places of our hearts that have been damaged by the effects of sin. He calls this woman his daughter, and by doing so, warmly welcomes her to experience the new life that he has given to her as his family member. This woman's disease would have prohibited her from physically touching anyone or being physically touched by anyone, which would have caused her to experience great isolation and rejection. What did she need? She needed to feel like she belonged and that someone cared about her. She needed to be reminded of Jesus' caring touch. Jesus speaks life-giving words that would have touched this woman's heart when he calls her daughter. Daughter in this context is used in in a way to show endearment and to to show the close relationship that family members have. This woman's disease had pushed her to the fringes of society, and Jesus would bring her near with his words. If words were translated into emojis, in this context, the word daughter would be translated into a hug emoji. By Jesus calling this woman his daughter, it's like he is sending her a a hug sticker or a hug emoji online. It's like a father wrapping his arms around his daughter and saying, you are my daughter, you belong to me, you are mine. This woman who had felt for so long like she didn't belong and she felt disconnected from others, now had a relationship with the one who could meet every desire of connectedness and belonging that her heart desired. She went from being a social outcast to being a beloved daughter of of the king. 
I can imagine this woman's joy when she heard Jesus say these words to her. She probably hadn't heard anyone say an endearing word to her for 12 years, much less call her by an endearing title like daughter. Going back to the question that the disciples asked Jesus in the boat, Jesus, do you care that we are perishing? Do you care about our lives? Jesus' answer is yes. Jesus cares about every aspect of his disciples' life. He even cares about our social life and came to give us a new life with a new sense of belonging. We, uh, we took Macy to a park within the first couple of months of arriving in Thailand, and she met two Thai boys on the playground and tried to play with them. They didn't speak English, and she didn't speak Thai. And so their playtime didn't go well, and after about two minutes, she came and she sat next to me on the bench, and she said, Dad, I, I don't think they like me. I don't think they want to play with me. I feel like I don't belong. And I put my arm around her, and I said, I know you don't feel like you belong to these boys, but you have a family that you belong to and who cares about you. Jesus spent precious time to communicate to this woman and us that we belong to him and are his family members. Let us take this message to heart. Some of you may be experiencing feelings of disconnect and rejection from others. You may be rejected by your earthly family, by society, by culture, by those who you thought were your close friends, by the company you work for, or even those who may be your brothers and sisters in the church. Sometimes, this is the blessed place that you can be in life because it encourages you to cling to Christ that much more to find your sense of belonging. Don't waste your earthly rejection. Allow your wounds of earthly rejection to drive you to the one where your ultimate sense of belonging is found. When we experience earthly rejection, it's so easy for us to wallow in it like a pig might sit down in the mud and just lay there all day. Think of every earthly rejection as an opportunity for you to find your ultimate sense of belonging in Jesus. And I want to challenge you to take 30 seconds uh, this week to think about your relationship with Jesus and seek to find your ultimate sense of belonging in him every time you feel rejected this week. When you don't meet the deadline at work and don't produce the quality of work that everyone is expecting you, and you know that your coworkers wish that the project had been given to someone else, take 30 seconds to think about the fact that you are a beloved son or daughter of the king. When a person that you are dating says, I need more space, it's not you, it's me, go to the one who calls you his child and find your belonging. When you're playing basketball and you are the only one on the team who can't catch the ball or make a basket, and you feel the stares of the, your teammates penetrating through your skin. Remember who you belong to. Your teammates may not talk to you after the game, but Jesus smiles upon you because you are his. If you forget to pick up the eggs at the grocery store on your way home from work, and your wife or your roommate is in the process of making bread and needs those eggs, and you can see the frustration on his or her face as you walk in empty-handed, Remember on your way back out to go get those eggs that Jesus loves forgetful people like you. Jesus wants us to have a sense of peace in life that comes from knowing that we belong to him. Because you are Jesus' son or daughter, you will never be rejected by him. He looks upon you with a sense of endearment as a loving and caring father looks upon his child. He wants you to know that you belong to him and heart are his beloved. If we end up in a situation at some point in our life where the whole world looks down on us, we have everything because we have a king who loves us and we belong to. There is nothing that we can do that will ever cause him to turn away from us so that we lose this close relationship that we have with him. Jesus not only gives this woman a new family and a new sense of belonging, he also gives her a new identity. Jesus continues to show us how much he cares about us by taking care of our emotional needs. How do you identify yourself? I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son to parents, I'm a Thai student, not a very good one, but I'm a Thai student. 
but I can play one song on the guitar, so I don't identify myself as a musician, and so I haven't joined the Gray City Band. And I can cook, but I don't let anyone know out of selfish motives because I don't want to. How does Scripture identify this woman? It tells us, And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Scripture doesn't paint a rosy picture of her, does it? Being a woman during Jesus' day meant that you didn't have much, if any, social status or standing. Mark doesn't even give us this woman's name. On top of this, she has a disease that makes her ceremonially unclean and would have made her a social outcast. She was not only someone that people didn't pay much attention to, she was someone that people intentionally tried to avoid. It would be hard to find someone who had a lower social status than this woman. She is suffering, and so she is in a lot of pain and probably mentally and physically weak. She has spent all of her money on physicians, so she is financially broke. Mark identifies this person who touches Jesus as a poor, no-name woman who is a social outcast that everyone tries to stay away from. How does Jesus describe this woman after he heals her? And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed from your disease. Jesus gives this woman a new identity. He calls her daughter. She goes from being a social outcast to having royal status as a daughter of the king. She goes from having no money to having access to the king who has an unlimited treasury. He then tells her that she has been made well. She goes from being dise diseased and looked down upon as being disease-free. She goes from being ceremonially unclean to being ceremonially clean and socially acceptable. Jesus doesn't want her to identify with her old identity anymore. He has rescued her from it and wants her heart to know this. He wants her to see herself in the way that he views her. She is his daughter, and he has made her well. When Jesus says, go in peace and be healed from your disease, he is saying, saying take what I have told you to heart and live your life accordingly. Don't live out of your past identity. This woman's old identity uh, had left her shackled in fear and shame, and it has now been replaced with a new identity that she should go and she should live out of. And Jesus wants her to experience peace and freedom from this new identity. In the movie The Help, a woman works as a, a maid and a nanny for a family who has a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. And this child's mother is so busy trying to please her friends and those that are around her that she neglects her daughter and leaves her for the nanny to raise. The mother doesn't want to, to hold or to hug her daughter, and she sees her more as a burden than a blessing. Several times in the movie, the, the nanny scoops the little girl up in her arms, and she looks her in the eyes, and she repeats this phrase. She says, you is kind, you is smart, you is important. She didn't want the girl to see herself in the same negative way that her mother viewed her. The nanny's hope was that she would see her based on the love and affection that she had for her, that she constantly expressed to her in the phrase, you is kind, you is smart, you is important. Jesus wants us to see ourselves as having a new identity. He wants us to take to heart these same words that he spoke to his daughter so that we experience the same peace and freedom he wanted her to experience. Jesus healing her of her bodily disease and making her ceremonially clean is a picture of him healing us of our spiritual disease, which is sin. This woman's disease makes her un ceremonially unclean, and it would have affected her status in society and also the religious system that Israel had during that time. Our sin makes our hearts unclean and affects our standing before our Lord, who is perfect. Jesus takes care of our sins so that in the eyes of the Lord, when we have faith in him, we immediately go from being filthy to being perfectly and completely clean. Even though you will continue to, to sin, God no longer looks upon you as sinful. God looks at you and says, 
You is kind. You is smart. You is important. God tells us in this passage, I have given you a new identity. Don't look at yourself as still having your old identity of sin. Go and live your life knowing your new identity and be set free from the shackles of fear and shame that you once experienced because of your old identity. You may be like the mom in the movie, The Help, and struggle to show love and affection to your children. Instead of giving them words of affirmation and disciplining them in love, you oftentimes yell at them in anger. If your faith is in Christ, he has dealt with your sin of neglect and abuse of your children at the cross. God doesn't see you as a neglectful mom. He sees you as his beautiful daughter. You may have some addiction to food, alcohol, work, or pornography that you continually fight and fall into. If your faith is in Christ, then God dealt with your sin of addiction at the cross. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you as an addict. He sees you as his righteous son. Children, you may struggle to listen to and obey your parents. God doesn't look on you in disgust and see you as a disobedient child. If your faith is in Christ, then God dealt with your sin at the cross, and he now looks upon you with endearment as his child. Christ has dealt with every one of our sins at the cross. The sins that we continue to commit, they no longer define who we are. No past, present, or future sin can take away our new identity of being clean before the Lord that he has given to us in Christ whenever Christ defeated our sin at the cross. And so rest assured that nothing can ever take away the new identity you have or the sparkle in God's eyes as he looks upon you as his child. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for how it teaches you about uh, teaches us about you. It teaches you us about your your power that you've shown through Jesus by him conquering our sin, by con- him conquering all of our enemies, all of the evil powers that keep would keep us from having life in you. Jesus, we thank you so much for going to the cross, for conquering our sin for us. The Father looked upon you as sin, dear Lord, so that we would be able to escape that, so that he can now look upon us as being clean. We thank you so much for the work that you have done for us. We thank you for caring about us so much. You want us to have peace, dear Lord. Uh, not only in the life to, to come, but also in this lifetime. We thank you for giving us a, a new belonging to you. Uh, we no longer um, are, have a rejection, dear Lord, that should cause us harm because our ultimate sense of, of belonging is found in you. We thank you for the new family that you have given to us. We are your beloved children, dear Lord. You look upon us with love. And so we thank you so much for conquering our sin. We thank you for your care and compassion for us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.